Well, good morning, everyone. I'm especially grateful because I'm not a morning person. So for all of you who made it here um, at this early hour and fought traffic, I really appreciate you taking the time to come. You had a chance to sleep in or come, come listen to me, so I appreciate you took the uh, second option. You know, I have been a great fan of Thai for many, many years since its founding and been involved with it um, in its grassroots efforts. Over the last 10 years, it's been difficult to come to Thai. In fact, I think the last time I came here, Arista was a startup with 50 employees and we won a Thai 50 award. So it's really my honor and pleasure to, to come here now and speak to you all and, and really, really share with you um, some of the entrepreneurial journey I had, but more importantly, the entrepreneurial journey that you all can have. Uh, it, it's, I know sometimes it looks daunting and it's very difficult to imagine and the stats for entrepreneurs are very much against you in that it's usually one in a hundred or one in a thousand and it's that needle in the haystack. But I'm here to tell you that a, in spite of all of that, it's one of the most amazing, exhilarating experiences you can have. And it isn't always about the fame and fortune and success. It's very much about the journey, so I'd like to share that with you. And uh, somewhere in the middle, we'll invite my good friend Quentin to do a little fireside chat so that we can make this more interactive. So first things first, who am I? Well, I've probably been here longer than many of you in the Silicon Valley. How many of you were here in 1981? Okay, that, and now you know I'm dating myself and you all. But back then, th this was really Silicon Valley. You had orchards and you had a Silicon Valley industry. My career started in Fairchild and um, um, AMD. In fact, I married my husband who was in Intel and we were in rival companies and he hated to come to my company parties because they were always bashing the competitor. But that foundation was really critical to where we all now. We all talk about how software eats hardware and how the industries migrated to software. But to be truthful, software has to run on something. And guess what it runs on? Most of the time it's silicon. So uh, that journey took me to a place in networking where I felt that the life cycle of building chips was very long. It, you know, it would take you two years to define a product, two to three years to build it. By the time you actually saw it in fruition in your market with customers, was, you know, sometimes the product was even obsolete because it was a five to 10 year journey. My journey into networking literally began when networking began. Um, I, I, I learned it through textbooks, I learned it through self-teaching, and I was very fortunate to get in at the uh, first rung of the ladder. A company called Ungerman Bass that doesn't even exist today for most part, but I think it's in the bowels of Compaq or HP sometime, really pioneered this along with 3Com. Uh, and then I had the itch that many do to go to a startup. Crescendo ended up becoming the first acquisition of Cisco, back when Cisco was even smaller than Arista. And I thought I'd be there two years to help them out. Our business ended up going from zero to 10 billion and overtook many of the existing businesses in Cisco. And my two year uh, career there became 15 years, two years at a time. Now most at that point, and even I wondered why I would ever go back to networking again. I took uh, a leave of absence and I actually looked at clean tech for quite a while with Vinod Khosla. But one thing you realize when you're in an industry and in a tech is you have to lead from something you know especially if you're gonna build a company, you cannot be figuring out or getting a PhD in, in a new topic. And you know, whether it was solar or batteries or all of the clean tech, it was still very embryonic. Um, Andy Bechtelstein, who, who co-founded um, Arista, which at that time was called the Restaurant Networks, um, call, uh, and I chatted and he and I had been very closely associated in Cisco. And I said, oh no, Andy, I'm not going back to networking again. But this was really networking with a twist. The cloud was in its infancy, and Arista really built the only today um, purpose-built software stack. And today we've gone from basically 30 employees to over 2,000 employees, more importantly, from zero to two billion in revenue and 20 billion in market cap. The, uh, our customers have really embraced us. Now when I look at what took Arista there or what'll take any of you there, I thought I'd share some of my guiding principles. And one of the biggest ones is don't just go build an incrementally better product. Challenge the status quo. Disrupt the market, not just with technology, because you can build a lot of widgets that are the right technology, but you also have to build the right customer disruption. 
The beauty of our company lay in the fact that there was a hardware disruption moving to merchant silicon, a software disruption moving to programmable SDN, software-driven stacks, and a customer division, the disruption where enterprises were moving more to cloud-like architectures. This is really important when you're building something, because if you're just doing, doing a little bit of a me too, the large companies can always catch up. Another thing that we firmly believe and I believe is uh, the difference between management and leaders. Management means you need adult supervision, and it's what we do when we're raising children. And it's an important thing. Uh, however, at some point, you have to allow empowered leadership. Otherwise, you're always building, as, as many companies do, a hierarchy of corporate leaders telling others what to do. In my company, nobody's just a manager. It's, a, it's, it's not a full-time job. It's important to co be a coach player and guide them, but not think that you don't have an individual con contribution to make. I ask every one of them to be a CEO of their own little sales territory or product or customer support or whatever that function. And it's, I'm not saying managers are not important. There are times they do. But leading and knowing where to go and allowing the individual to define how that is when give them the space to do it is very much, I think, a core way to get it done. Business model can be very controversial. One of the things that I did that some may believe actually hurt the company or helped the company was not focus on sales and marketing. And of course, we didn't have the billboards. You couldn't get up in air at airports and see an Arista logo like you can many times because we were not selling to consumers. We were selling to enterprises. And when you're selling to enterprises, they really don't care whether you have a brand or not. Of course, they want to have a brand. And your business model can define. And we, 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 we made a pledge that we didn't want to just keep losing money. So within three years of shipping product, we were already breaking even. And so then you have to make a decision. Do you invest in engineering? Do you invest in support? Do you invest in sales and marketing? And if you do everything, you're most certainly going to lose money if your top line's not growing. And that's a key aspect of, I think, how, um, how you evolve the company. A strong principle of mine is try to make some experiments before you have the data. Probably if you have the data, it's too late to actually make a decision. So the ability to extrapolate and go someplace and then pull back if you have to and adapt I think is a very key principle. And then finally, do the right thing. I don't know how many people I've said this to, but often knowing what the right thing is to do is as hard as saying, do the right thing. We had a crisis in my company where we nearly went under. We had shipped a whole slew of products just before we went public, and every one of them had uh, ECC memory um, failure, soft error failure. Those are the most difficult to detect. Our customers won't find it because it's a slow degradation, and then one day your product just fails. When we found it, we were horrified, and we were working with the vendor who um, created that, and they couldn't even find. They couldn't even reproduce the failure rate. We made a conscious decision, even though we didn't have the money, to um, call back every unit in the field and upgrade it with a new one. And even to this day, even though it was the worst thing we ever did, it's actually the best thing we ever did for our customers. They remember us for solving the crisis more than they remember us for the great products we built. So, you know, in your mind, even though there are business goals and even though there are higher, uh, you know, um, uh, revenue, top line, gross margin, whatever the right goals are, probably the greatest one is to make sure you live not just for the short term, but for the long term if you can help it. And this, this compass gives us the, the, the guiding principles and helps you build a company with long-lasting values. When you look at Dryer's ice cream, they took 12 years from, to hit a billion dollars. When you look at Microsoft, they took six years to do that. When you look at fast-paced companies like Google, Broadcom, eBay, they took um, four years. Arista and perhaps Facebook were the only two that took less than two to achieve that. And this inflection point is important because for a long time you're evangelizing, and then eventually one day it, the customers start um, coming to you in, some, in a way that they finally understand. And this is a combination of marquee customers, awesome culture, and really the customers who brought us here. Now, I think when I look at the overall market and enterprise, it's also important to recognize that everybody says we go after a large TAM, total available market. And Arista's market, by the way, is very large too. It's 30 billion. But it's also equally important to say, what is your available market? TAMs are great for everyone to go after, but what can you go after? And so one of Arista's greatest um, focus areas was focus. You have to be as clear about what you do as what you don't do. 
We recognize that users, devices, IoT was all coming together and is now a powerful WorkX user. We recognize the public, the private, and the hybrid clouds are all coming together. We recognize that today you work at home, you work at work, you work in mobile transit in an Uber. You can be anywhere, any cloud, any location. And most importantly, we recognize that you know, the killer application is increasingly workflows, video, data. In 2005, there was less than 9 billion video streaming, because streaming was separate. Today, it's in the mainstream of all communication. By 2015, it was 50 billion streams. Do you know what the prediction is for 2020? A trillion streams. That means we all, whether it's the way we work, live, learn, play, television, Disney, movies, it is all happening through interaction. This, this generation is one of the most visuals that we're seeing, and this is changing the way we have to think of our enterprise infrastructure. Now, I commonly get asked a lot of questions. What does it feel like to be a woman? How does it feel like to be an entrepreneur? You know, how does it to build a great company? And I'm sure my friend Quentin will ask me a few of those, but I thought I'd you know, sort of predict some of the questions. The, what does it feel like to be a woman? Well, you know, for the 50% uh, of us who are all women, it feels great. But uh, you know, I, I don't think you should be, any of us carry that badge of honor as a unique trait. We still have to have the right capabilities, competence, and results. So I won't spend that much time on that. But I would like to say, what does it feel, and how is it you want to be a great entrepreneur. My number one advice to you would be start with an entrance strategy, not an exit strategy. Don't start by thinking of how you're going to get bought or how you're going to go IPO. You know, if you don't worry about the destination, but you think of the milestones to that, you will build a much more long-lasting foundation for whatever the end goal and strategy might become. I think that's a key piece. Build the right team and people. You know, especially when you're a young company, it is so important for you to be united. It is so important for you to have different opinions, argue, debate, challenge, and then align. And I cannot emphasize how, what a key foundation that is, uh, you know, because there's no room. You know, family, you don't get to choose. You can have a dysfunctional aunt or uncle. But people, you do get to choose. And this becomes your professional family that you often spend so much time with that it's very important. And don't think of return for you, but return for the company. Because if the company does well, you're going to do well. And that, that are sort of three principles that I'd really like to share with you and leave. And what makes a great company? Very much the same thing that we, I, I said earlier. Build a foundational technology that's disruptive, not for a year. Because in technology, you know, things change every three years. You have to keep building it. When we built our first software stack, it was only 30,000 lines of code. Today, it's 11 million. But the, a key part of that 11 million is making sure we gut the foundation and change it every year, every three years. Often hardware changes every six months to a year. Software doesn't change for decades. But keeping that team focused on that change, even if it doesn't have immediate customer benefit, becomes very important. Adding to that the business model, having the right marquee customers when Arista went through one of its greatest crises, we were sued by our competitor for four, four and a half years. Their goal was to bring us down as a company. The greatest supporters for us was our customers. One of them said to me, Jayshree, our plan A was to use Arista. Our plan B was to use your competitor. Now that they've sued you, we have to go look at a different plan B. You know, the, they increased our brand and increased the loyalty with our customers through an action they did not plan on doing, obviously, that. And luck and timing and momentum, they play a key role. If anybody tells you that success just comes, you can work really hard sometimes, and I'm sure you've all been through it, and not see the results. And other times when you think, oh, it's not going to happen, suddenly your customers buy the product, and suddenly something clicks. So there is a real set of recipe and ingredients that go in a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But I can tell you from where I'm sitting that probably some of my greatest successes have really come with a great deal of setback. Uh, they go hand in hand. It's never one continuum of great things that happen to you. So with that, I'd like to, I think I've used up my speaking time. Um, I'd like to uh, invite Quentin Hardy for a um, chat. He's the editorial lead at Google Cloud and a good friend that I've known for many, many years. Um, he's uh, you know, one of these unique, curious editorial leaders who doesn't just report what's said, but really makes you think and asks the right questions. Quentin, are you there? Come on in.
Welcome, Quentin. Thank you. And today I am particularly proud to know you. Oh, thank you. Because I actually was at Arista when it was six it, or eight people. Yeah, it was at the basement of a law building. Right. Uh, we couldn't afford um, anything else, so the shelving area of the law building is, became our home. By the way, I just want you to know the lawyer, the law firm went under, and we went on to become a great company. Price of greatness, so, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you know, with you and Andy in that room, I knew there was a lot of wattage, and you would walk through walls, uh -oh. which is what it takes. So Thank you. Congratulations today. And thank you. So, you know, you're being honored for success today. And I was thinking about this a little bit, and we talk often about the challenges that face a company when revenues are a million, yep. and then when revenues are 10 million. It's a truism. When it's 100 million, each time the company goes through an organizational and a cultural and a kind of existential shift. And I was thinking about um, maybe there's a parallel for success. What does success mean when you're aiming for a, a million in revenue? And what does success mean when you achieve 10 million in revenue and 100 million? And what does success mean when revenues cross a billion? How do you keep yeah, redefining it's, success? It's very different. I think there are different phases of the company. From a million to 10 million, you know, I think you're really looking to build that breakthrough technology. You're trying to prove why you're better. And you're also appealing to a, a niche set of customers often who, who are in some ways you know, the, lead, the innovators, the leader of the pack, the thought leaders. So even your customers have to be the same way. And they end up becoming your champions. You're not necessarily applying to the mainstream. Because, but you're trying to figure out your recipe. Because if you figure out that recipe, then you can know how to rinse and re repeat and replicate um, to get to a billion. And you bring them success that creates envy among many other customers. Very true. And in some ways, the one to 10 million, you're actually creating a market. The billion to beyond, you're fulfilling the market. It's a mm -hmm. little bit different. Um, and and you, you have to change your stance. You still have to innovate, but the type of innovation changes. Uh, as an example today, one of the greatest areas of our innovation besides technology and go-to-market is quality and support. You have to worry about a lot more of that as a foundational thing, not just we'll give you good quality and we'll test everything, but how do you assure availability and quality right from the get-go? Mm -hmm. That matters a lot because now that means your production installations are millions of servers that you're connecting to rather than a handful. Are you saying that the brand changes or it acquires more depth and range? The, the brand doesn't change, it gets reinforced. So you go, like you said, more horizontally and more vertically as well. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's a very interesting stat that we always paid attention to quality. I talked about the recall we did. But the way you pay attention to it, uh, you know, and how you support your customers, and how you understand their OPEX needs, you don't just focus on, I have a new technology. You focus much more on the deployment methodologies for the technology. Mm -hmm. And what are the best things that customers are challenging you to do now? Well, I think now, you know, while we think of ourselves as an agile, nimble startup, they look at us as a big company, which has been a bit of an adjustment for us. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it's no more just us evangelizing to them. They're going to, wait, what's your three to five year vision? In the past, my three to five year vision was non existent. I just was looking at survival for three to five quarters, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm a little stunned when they ask me that. I'm used to answering it in bigger companies like Cisco. But I think we've earned a seat in the table uh, where they don't just want to think of us as a successful startup, mm -hmm. but we've sort of gone from the infant to the adolescent, and now we're perceived as an adult. I'm glad to hear you step up to that because... It's not easy. You know, you like to think of yourself as a, one's an entrepreneur, a fast-moving yeah. rule breaker. Yeah. All those things can possibly still be true, but you are a durable and important part of an industry and of the world economy and of technology. People are training there to learn key things that will matter for the future. And that's an... Let's take that back in the context of success. What is success for a big, you know, important well, think, company um, like that. I think there will be a phase two definition of success for Arista moving forward, that you still must take the principles that helped you be successful, commitment to quality, support, customers, but now you have to think of scale in a mm -hmm. very different way. And, and, and while the leadership team should be united and the same for most part, you've got to bring in more new leaders to do that. Uh, and it's something that we will grapple with, but you have to change. Because you cannot think that the same recipe that you had for your first success 
is, is applicable. Some of it is, but has to change. And I think one of the things I look to do as a CEO is question even my last 10 years of decisions and see if they make sense for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So it may not, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the other thing we have to question is uh, whether we have to do everything um, organically. Perhaps there are inorganic components and mergers and acquisitions and buying companies. Uh, one of the first companies we did buy um, last year is uh, Mojo Networks in the Wi-Fi area. We didn't have radio management ex expertise. And it was particularly gratifying for me because it was based in Pune. And it was one of the rare product companies in India that ended up being our first acquisition. So you're now talking about organic and organic together, old leaders, new leaders together, and also attacking a set of customers that are no more the early adopters, but maybe more of the mainstream. And also culture takes on a much greater resonance. That is so true. Uh, you know, culture is probably the one thing you don't want to change in phase two. You want to retain that. You never want to get old and stodgy. And uh, you know, I, I, I really like to touch as many of my employees as possible, but it gets hard to do as we move from a basement of the building to multi-floors, and now we're in nine different geographies. Um, so you have to find other ways to reinforce culture and, and, and remind, them, remind everyone, including myself, that people are the greatest asset. What is the toughest thing to nurture in culture? What is the thing you worry about losing or you feel can go stale? I think the hardest thing is maintaining it, meaning as you get further and further from these people, it was one thing when you all met in the corridor, it'll be easy for new people to come in and say, well, this is the way it was done in that company, so we're going to bring those practices. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I think you have to bring the best of both. You have to create that melting point of what are the characteristics you want to bring for scale, but what are the ones you still want to fight to retain? And I use the word fight very specifically because you, you don't want to lose that. How many, how many of you have seen young companies lose their way and become a corporation and miss product cycles, innovation, miss customer uh, timelines. So probably the greatest aspect of culture we want to retain is all the things that brought us here. Mm -hmm. And it's like a little cake with icing. We want to keep that culture and then add triple layers of cho chocolate or vanilla icing on top of that. How do you describe Arista's culture internally to your people? Um, we have something called the Arista way. And it, I, I'd probably summarize it best in one line, do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So even today, for example, even though we have quarterly earnings and for 18 quarters we've beaten the earnings, um, uh, we try not to just live by the quarter. Um, I'll give you a little secret, guys. My salespeople don't have a quota. You may say, how on earth do you drive your numbers without a quota? Of course, they have guidelines, but we don't believe in quotas. We think the customer drives the budget, and what's the point in us defining a number when they have a number in mind with the quota? And it may not exactly happen at the window of the quarter that we give the quota to. So I think doing the right thing, looking long term, even if it means you know, not, not making a number in a quarter or not doing exactly the targets you wished is very and much part of our culture. Doing the right thing can mean many things relative to the company. Yeah. I'm going to hazard an insight, because one oh, time sure. I was talking to Andy Bechtelsheim, and he was talking about some product in his house, and it was just <laughs> bothering him. It was just like, you know, and I, I said to him, it really, really bothers you when something isn't well made. Yes. Yes. It does. Yes. It's like, you know, if you settle for less than the great engineering outcome, the great yes. process, That's it's just going to bother him. It's going to be a seed in his teeth. Yes, very much. And I much. suspect you, you tend toward an engineering-led sense of do the right thing. It, make it well built for the customer. Yeah, we're definitely a company built by engineers for engineers. So, you know, we're, we're very technology-led. And I'm reminded of a story with Andy where he was actually, you know, he designs, even today, he's very active in designing our data center. And he was even designing our office space. And he, he said, what do you think of that? I said, Andy, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about this. So he throws three examples of the carpet space he would like to see and say, which one do you like? And I go, really? I go, OK, one, two, three. He goes, yeah, that was my one, two, three, two. Yeah. But I, I was surprised that my founder, who was just you know, impe impeccable hardware design, designer, was still interested in designing our floor offices as well. Mm -hmm. That's Andy at the core. And I think that's all of us at the core. We lead from our strengths. You know, I write my own blogs. Uh, I work closely with the engineering team and um, my COO to define them. I'm very customer driven. I still try to touch them. So, None of us are up there in ivory tower. We're very much so down that, here on the ground. So is that an easy, if it is engineering-led, make the right thing, is that something that's easy to 
inculcate in salespeople, marketing people, other parts that are further away from that kind of discipline? Yes, it is, and yes, it's not. You know, as you know, so our salespeople are also engineering-led. Most of them were systems engineers. Uh, but as an example, we, if, if they only are in sales and relationship-driven and don't have an inert understanding of a technology, they struggle mm -hmm. in that company. And they struggle to also give the value proposition. So I think you can be a different type of engineer in sales than you would be in software development. But I think that technical foundation never lets you down no matter what job you and have. It points to who your customer you bet. is going to be and it, too. And it leads to that foundation. And again, as we evolve and as we go into non-technical areas, that may change. Mm -hmm. But I still, still think as a high-tech company, we're very much rooted there. Just surveying the room, I think there's a couple of people out there looking for entrepreneurial opportunities. A bit. I think all of them. So let's change gears in our last few minutes and talk about um, the relationship to the market as you grow. Mm -hmm. There is a certain sense of the market at a billion, and, or at a, but previously at one million. When you're thinking about where the market might be in a couple of years and how you'll get to the right product market fit, you make sales, as you said. You've got profitable relatively quickly. But you're always thinking about where the market's going and how the market's acting. Now you're, you have a customer base and a size that in some way shapes the market or creates opportunities for other people. So talk about how you see the world in three years and where you're aiming or Oh, you sound like my customers asking for the three to five year vision. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, there. Um, you know, I think no question we're engineering driven. No question you have to be customer driven. But I think there's also one other aspect, which is you've got to be market driven. You've got to understand the segment you're in and how you're going to excel there. And by the way, what segment you're not going to be in. Um, one of the things that I think distracts many corporations is they decide to be in everything, mm -hmm. right? So we're a networking company. We've been purpose built for the cloud. We're going to focus on the cloud. But, but the beauty of that statement, as I look at my three to five year vision, is the cloud is not just permeating the cloud. It's permeating every enterprise, every IoT device. You know, I call it the client to cloud uh, solution. So while it was not sexy to be in the enterprise infrastructure business you know, many years ago when we started and every venture capitalist was funding social media or you know, Zynga or gaming or you name it, this is, this is hard to build. And once you're su successful, you can really extend the tentacles. So I believe what we're doing will not just affect the cloud, but you can bring cloud principles into your enterprise infrastructure. It's going to change the way enterprise networks are built. It's going to break down the silos between a branch, a campus, a data center, a core router. And places in the network, which was a you know, whole spaghetti code of stuff, will move to places in the cloud. And I think the second phenomena that you and I were discussing backstage is you know, the definition of a user is going to change tremendously. I know we all love to use the word, no, no, no answer is complete without using machine learning and artificial intelligence. But I don't think that's a market. I think that's a huge enabler. It's an attribute, And yeah. it's, a, it's such a huge attribute in how you can attack all the users, all the devices, you know, every IoT machine out there. Because now you can do the right inference, the right pattern matching. It wasn't like we weren't doing AI and ML before. But the level of AI and ML you can do and the scale of it is, is profound. And also, I mean, I can speak from the world I'm in now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We and, to some extent, other clouds are taking AI now from a purpose-built area into an industrial process. Exactly. If you look at the way the chips are being created, the, in the case of TensorFlow, the way TPU pods are being produced and rented out, this is a process, and that means prices will be crushed Right. and therefore use cases will increase and right. front-end usability will improve. You bet. So it, as will just you be bring in it will be baked into creation of Very software. much so. As, as you bring in the GPUs and, uh, from TensorFlow and NVIDIA, it's creating a, a voluminous amount of data on the network. You're speaking of Google TPU chips, of course. Of course. And NVIDIA. And NVIDIA and, and Intel, others. And, you know, yeah. We've got to add them in yeah. you know, no, it'll uh, be a, and make a this a little more GPU-friendly uh, and TPU-friendly. But the point I was making is the, the crunching how you crunch is one, how you store is another, and then how you move the data, which is where we come in with the data movement, is, is really profound. Because now what you have to do is not just move the data, but deal with the right analytics and stream the data and have the right almost sensors to gather the information. There's almost too much of information. How do you correlate it? How do you trend it? How do you visualize it? How do you pattern match it? And this is very exciting. I think the future of bringing those cloud principles, not just from the public cloud, but bringing it to every enterprise, every branch, every IoT, 
is going to require compute, storage, and networking to come together in a systematic fashion. Nothing changes, but it just takes place on a bigger scale. Compute, Better. storage, and network. And every turn of the platform, compute, storage, and network improve, and they create new types of data and new ways of seeing data. If you look at the rise of the relational database right. into client-server, right. there's something like that going on, yeah, where new so data and new databases will so even though the public cloud and, and especially Google and Amazon and Microsoft changed the face of networking forever, I think it's going to be, a, it's only in its early innings. And it's going to create many more forms of clouds. And uh, you know, some may be vertical, some may be horizontal, some may be very enterprise specific. And, and, that's the, and it's a thing of beauty. So I think that that vision is going to go well beyond three to five years, and I couldn't be more excited. Sounds like be we better get back to work. I think so. And you all spend the weekend inventing new companies. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.